Hello, uh, my name is Stefan Zimmerman. I'm an assistant professor here at Johns Hopkins University uh, in the Department of Radiology. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about cardiac CT and how do you do it. So first, uh, just a couple images from um, the lay press. This is um, uh, just basically reflecting on cardiac CT and where we are with cardiac CT. So it's, it's gotten a lot of attention recently, and this is an image on the left of Oprah and Dr. Oz, I think they're, they're showing Oprah's cardiac CT even. Um, and then on the right, an image from Time Magazine showing um, uh, several years ago showing a cardiac CT and how, um, talking about how important it is and, and so on. So, um, you know, it's important, I think, as radiologists and, and, and um, cardiac imagers that, that we um, have some knowledge and some ability to perform cardiac CT. Certainly people are asking for it and as we um, go uh, forward um, we're going to see it I, I think grow and grow and so it really uh, behooves us to, to, to um, learn how to do cardiac CT, high quality cardiac CT and, and provide that service to our patients who are, are definitely going to want it. So let's talk a little bit about how, how do we do cardiac CT. So um, this is an outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, first, um, we're going to touch on the technical aspects of cardiac CT. So maybe not as much fun, but unfortunately very important. Um, we really need to know how do you perform cardiac CT, and that, that really boils down to how do you do ECG-gated imaging. We need to know about some of the various decisions you have to make when you're setting up cardiac CT protocols. Uh, what are the differences between prospective and retrospective gating? How do you decide which one to use depending on the clinical scenario? Uh, we also are going to talk about dose reduction techniques, which are really, really critical in cardiac CT. Um, cardiac CT has taken a lot of heat for high uh, radiation dose in the past, and um, the, the vendors have, have appropriately responded by uh, giving us a lot of options now to reduce radiation dose, but they don't work unless you use them. So uh, it's very important for us to, to review these techniques so you have that knowledge and can apply it in your practice. And then we're going to review injection protocols, how to get very high quality images with good injections. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about cardiac CT in practice and uh, what are the appropriate indications for coronary CT. Review some, <coughs> excuse me, some case examples, uh, and then discuss potential pitfalls and challenging scenarios that you may encounter when you're performing coronary CT. So first, let's talk about the technical aspects um, of cardiac CT. So, so how does it work and, and what's needed? So first, let's talk about what are the requirements of cardiac CT. So the main issues that we're dealing with or that we're fighting against in cardiac CT is the need for very, very high temporal resolution. And this is because the heart is beating, right? And so if the heart's beating, then that means um, it's going to be harder for us to, to take an image, right? It's always harder to take a picture of something moving than, than something that's still. And so we need very, very high temporal resolution, which can freeze that motion and give us a very high quality image. Now, the other thing we need is high spatial resolution. And the reason is, is that coronary arteries are quite small. So coronary arteries range in size from one to four millimeter, roughly, in the general population. So that's really, really small. Um, and we need to be able to image this not only at very high temporal resolution, but also high spatial resolution with isotropic voxels, which will allow us to um, perform 3D reconstructions. So this is very challenging, and really, in general, cardiac CT is probably the most challenging type of uh, study you're going to do with your uh, CT scanner, and a lot of the developments in, um, in CT scanning uh, technology have been um, sort of pushed in, in part by cardiac CT, which really sort of takes the scanner capabilities to its limits. Um, now, the other important thing is that not only do we have to have high temporal and spatial resolution, but then we also have to have very low radiation dose. So again, it really is a, a challenge to, to get uh, good cardiac CT, but, but fortunately, um, the vendors have responded and we have a lot of great options out there um, for, for how to perform high quality studies with, with our current uh, equipment. So um, this is just an example of our goal. Uh, our goal is to freeze cardiac motion. So left side is a non-gated study and on the right side is a gated study. So in this case on the right side we synced up our CT acquisition to the cardiac cycle and that allows us to eliminate this um, motion which causes which is blurring due to the fact that we're acquiring images as the heart's moving. So let's take a step back a little bit and talk first about temporal resolution. So how do we maximize temporal resolution in cardiac CT? <clears throat> As you may remember from physics um, way back when, 
um, the temporal resolution is determined by how long does it take to actually acquire the data needed for an image. So in this case, you see uh, a, a figure of um, uh, this is going to be our pretend patient here in the middle of the image. This is the radiation source, and this is these are the X-ray beams passing through the patient and being picked up by the detectors. So the the source is rotating right as the patient passes through the cardiac. Uh, as the patient passes through the CT scanner, and the detectors are rotating as well, and so they are acquiring data, uh, projection data, um, um, as it's being formed uh, by the uh, x-rays passing through the patient. So it turns out that to have adequate projection data to make an image, you need to have half of a rotation around the patient. So you need to have the source travel 180 degrees around the patient to have 180 degrees of projection data to make an image. Um, so in general, temporal resolution then is defined by the amount of time it takes for one complete revolution, the gantry rotation time divided by two. Um, and that's for our single source detectors. So gantry ro rotation time divided by two equals temporal resolution as a general rule. Now there is an exception, and the exception um, is something that's becoming more and more common, and that's dual source scanning. Um, so this is an example of a dual source scanner. Um, we have two x-ray tubes, um, and in this case, each of those tubes can independently contribute 90 degrees of data to uh, forming an image. So in that case, we only have to go uh, half as far as we did in the previous example, so uh, we only need to go one quarter of a revolution to get um, 180 degrees of projection data. Um, so in the case of dual source imaging, uh, the, the temporal resolution is defined by the gantry rotation di time divided by four as a, as a rough estimate. So if we have a typical gantry rotation time for um, available CT scanners now roughly somewhere in the order of 250 to 330 milliseconds. Um, that gives us, um, when we calculate it out, a range of roughly 63 to 135 milliseconds for um, currently available CT scanners. So certainly it covers a wide range, um, but it turns out that the ideal that we want is 50 milliseconds. So if we could somehow reach 50, that actually is the number that will completely freeze motion in any part of the cardiac cycle. But we're not there yet. We're, we're close, but not quite there. So we'll get to do some tricks. Um, so how do we fix this problem? So we have to go back first and talk about the cardiac cycle. So if you, got, uh, if you remember, um, the cardiac cycle and the EKG, basically um, you know, the cardiac cycle starts with the P wave which comes from the sinoatrial node. That P wave um, sends electrical impulses down through the right and left atria to the AV node. Um, the atrioventricular node then passes those signals on to the left ventricle. So you get the uh, initial P wave, which is the atrial contraction, um, and then a little bit of a delay as the uh, signals pass through the AV node. And then you get the, the QRS complex here, or just the R wave for short. And that R wave is signifying the contraction of the ventricles. And then you get this long pause. Um, this long pause here is diastole. So diastole is after the R wave and before the P wave. And so it turns out that diastole um, is a nice time to image the heart. Because if you look at the cartoon here, in diastole the heart's not moving. Um, so diastole is really where we want to target our imaging uh, in cardiac CT, especially if we have um, a, f a relatively low temporal resolution system. So this is just an EKG example here. This is what your scanner sees when somebody is hooked up to the EKG uh, leads um, in your CT scanner. So the scanners are not very smart. Um, the scanners only look for one thing. They recognize the R wave. So they're looking for peaks. They don't find P waves. They don't find Q, uh, you know, the QRS complex. Rather, all they are looking for is peaks in the EKG signal to identify the R waves. So in normal uh, um, you know, cardiology terms or in the rest of medicine, the um, cardiac cycle is defined by the, the, the P wave. The P wave is the start of the cardiac cycle. However, in the world of cardiac CT, and actually turns out cardiac MRI as well, um, we define the cardiac cycle by the distance from R wave to R wave. And, and the reason is that because, as I said, the um, scanners don't recognize P waves. They just know R wave to R wave. So our cardiac cycle is the R wave to R wave interval. So it turns out that we actually have two uh, sort of sweet spots in the R to R interval, which can allow us to perform decent or even high, uh, not decent, I should, I should say high quality imaging of the coronary arteries <coughs> because they represent 
points in the cardiac cycle where the heart is relatively still. And the first of those is 40% of the R interval. And this is <clears throat> a rough number. It's around 40%. Some patients, it may be a little bit less, a little bit more, but somewhere in the you know, 35 to 45% range. Um, generally, this is an area of the cardiac cycle where you can get pretty good imaging. Um, this is the end of systole. And then the ideal usually is around 70%. This is uh, towards the end of diastole. Um, and for your uh, scanners that are a little bit on the slower side in terms of temporal resolution, this is really where you're going to do most of your imaging. Um, turns out, as an aside, that um, patients or, or scanners that are um, have relatively uh, um, low temporal resolution, in those cases, you really want to target diastole um, because diastole has a, a longer quiet period, um, and so you have a little bit more of a fudge factor there. So um, when you have a slower or a lower temporal resolution scanner, um, you want to have a low heart rate, and you want to image in the in that um, end diastole range somewhere 65 to 75 percent of the R R interval. Um, so when you have one of these scanners which has a, a lower temporal resolution, some of your your older scanners, your 64 slice scanners, for instance, um, heart rate control becomes important because you really need to get good diastolic imaging. So in those cases, beta blockers are, are quite important. Some of the new scanners, however. Um, are a little bit faster. Um, so some of your dual source scanners and, and, and other scanners which use um, uh, various um, you know, um, uh, higher gantry rotation speeds, et cetera, to do um, higher temporal resolution imaging, actually it turns out in those cases you, you have a little bit more flexibility. You can image at a higher heart rate. Um, and by, by high I mean over 70 beats per minute. Um, in those cases though, diastole turns out is not the best place to image, but rather we want to image around 40% of the RR interval as I uh, showed on that previous image. So um, in the setting of high heart rates, um, you want to target systole around 40%. And again, this is something that you know you might not be able to get away with with your older 64 slice scanners, but certainly in the newer generation scanners, it's something that's become more of a possibility. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about prospective gating and retrospective gating. So if you're performing cardiac CT, this is a really critical piece of information that you need to consider when you're putting together your protocols. So prospective gating is the easier concept to explain. Prospective gating is, is step and shoot imaging. And so basically what happens is the um, EKG is monitored by the um, uh, scanner and the scanner is following the R waves as they tick off one at a time. And so the, the, the scanner is basically, you know, um, remembers the R waves and is kind of taking an average um, R to R interval and figuring out, predicting when the next R wave is going to occur. And so based on previous R waves, the scanner assumes, okay, I know this patient's heart rate is X. And so I know if I wait um, a certain number of milliseconds after this R wave that I just saw and I start imaging that I'm going to be imaging in diastole. Um, <clears throat> And so that's what happens. Based on previous uh, beats, the uh, scanner will predict um, when diastole will be and will start imaging. Um, and then so in diastole, you, you acquire some images, and then you wait. And you wait for the next R wave, and you move the patient a little bit, um, and then you get to the next part of the anatomy, and you start imaging again in diastole. And then you move the patient again a little more and image diastole. So what's happening, you have these step and shoot. So the patient, you, get it, you scan a little bit of the anatomy, then, um, you know, depending on how, how much you scan depends on your detector width, but you scan as much as you can. Then you um, move the patient. While you're moving the patient, you're waiting for that next R wave to hit. And then you, the scanner predicts the next diastole and then scans and, and repeat. So again, step and shoot. Um, the advantage of this type of uh, imaging, the prospective gating, is reduced radiation dose. So you're really only um, turning on the x-ray tube when you need it, when you need that um, uh, 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 corneal artery imaging information, but at the rest of the time, the uh, tube is off. Um, so this is a, a lower radiation dose than the um, retrospective gating, which I'm going to show you next. Um, the other thing, no helical scan artifacts, not, not a big deal really with our, our current um, scanner hardware. It's, the scan artifacts are not a problem really. Um, what are the disadvantages? Well, because you're only imaging during a certain portion of the cardiac cycle, you can't get any functional data. So um, you cannot um, reconstruct this data and look at, say, the beating heart, for instance, if somebody wanted to look at ejection fraction, et cetera. Um, the other thing is it is a one-shot deal. So um, anytime you have um, the step-and-shoot method, you have the potential for problems because the, the patient's 
heart rate isn't always perfectly predictable. So sometimes the R to R interval changes. If it changes, then you may end up imaging in what you think is di uh, diastole, but it turns out it actually is systole, and you'll get a lot more motion and um, um, blurring in that situation. Now, there are some... Um, some ways to compensate for this. Uh, the scanners do use arrhythmia um, rejection, which basically means if the scanner senses an R wave too soon, then it won't take that image, but rather wait a little bit longer for the next R wave. It seems to be more appropriately timed. Um, and so there is a little bit of compensation for that. Um, however, uh, that can cause problems in that now you're waiting for more R waves, the breath hold becomes longer, so you may now run into breathing artifacts. Um, so, so that is the really the main potential pitfall of the step and shoot method is that um, you know heart rate irregularity can cause some problems. Okay, so what is the alternative? The alternative is retrospective gating. <coughs> retrospective gating is um, basically the patient passes very, very, very slowly through the scanner with the idea that as the patient passes slowly through the scanner, they're going so slow that you're over scanning the anatomy. And you're basically passing the patient through the scanner just long enough so that you can image every portion of the heart throughout the whole cycle. So for instance, if the cardiac cycle is um, 1,000 milliseconds, then you're going to be over scanning that portion of the anatomy for 1,000 milliseconds, and then you can go back later and reconstruct that data into different bins, and those bins um, will allow you to separate out, say, diastole and systole. Um, so, so this is um, a, a a different technique that that, that get, has a couple advantages and disadvantages. So the one advantage is because you're imaging the entire cardiac cycle, you can get functional data. So if if a patient needs an ejection fraction from their cardiac CT, you can do that with retrospective gating. You also have more flexibility for compensating for arrhythmia artifacts because you're imaging throughout the whole cycle. So <clears throat> you can actually reconstruct throughout the whole cycle. And if you see an abnormal beat, um, you actually have the ability to go back and edit the EKG so you can just kind of uh, rearrange um, the way you're, you're, you're um, organizing the data and, and you have some ability to compensate for uh, these arrhythmias. Um, breathing, you still can't fix breathing artifacts. That's something you can't, you can't uh, deal with with either prospective or retrospective gating techniques, unfortunately. So the main disadvantage, the big, you know, it, it, all things being considered equal, we would always do retrospective gating if we could, but the problem is, and the reason we don't tend to do a lot of retrospective gating is because of the higher radiation dose. So um, the tube is always on, therefore the patient's getting more radiation. Um, the pitch is quite low, and it has to be low because we're over scanning. Um, so the big disadvantage here is high radiation dose, and that's why most places tend to favor prospective gating over retrospective gating. Um, here's just an example of what you can do with retrospective gating if you if you need to provide cardiac function imaging. Um, this is a patient with congenital heart disease who um, they needed to really look at right ventricular volumes and function. Um, you can see some um, surgical material here on the right-handed right hand image or video I should say. Um, this is related to repair of tetralogy of Fallot. So the patient has a big right ventricle, a big right atrium, and they really wanted to know ventricular size and function um, in this patient with known pulmonic regurgitation. They couldn't get an MRI because of um, um, they had some, some leads um, that, that, that weren't MR compatible. And so they came to CT. So, so this is something that, that you can do with a retrospective gating in CT. Um, um, again, the disadvantage here is that the radiation dose is a little bit higher. How, there are some tricks that you can apply to reduce the dose, and we'll, we'll talk about those later. Um, so just a, a little bit of an aside, I want to talk a little bit about pitch. So I mentioned that retrospective gating relies on very low pitch. Um, and if you remember, the concept of pitch is how much the patient moves through the table relative to how much the gantry is spinning. And so in the sitting of a, of a pitch of one, that means in the time the patient moves through the table, the table motion, the distance of table motion is equivalent to the gantry, um, or excuse me, the detector width. So that um, one um, uh, rotation, in one rotation, the patient has moved through the, the scanner and you get basically perfect one-to-one um, -one match of the pitch. If you increase the pitch, that means that the patient moves through uh, faster than your, um, 
uh, uh, or moves further than your detector width um, in one full detector rotation. Um, generally, uh, you know, for most scanning, we use a pitch somewhere between one and two, um, higher than one. And the reason is that, we, again, we only need half of the projection data to make an image. So um, you don't need a pitch of one. You don't need 360 degrees of, of detector data. Rather, you need um, roughly half of that. So usually for most, um, uh, say, body imaging that we do, we, we have a pitch that's a little bit higher than one. Um, what about uh, the low pitch? So in low pitch, um, when you're less than one, that means you're over scanning. So um, you're actually um, uh, covering the same uh, anatomy um, in multiple gantry rotations. Um, and the typical pitch for somebody who's doing a retrospectively gated study is in the order of 03 or so. So there's quite a bit of overscanning that happens with um, retrospective gated studies. Well, what is the optimal pitch? Well, for a retrospective gated study, the optimal pitch is the pitch that allows imaging through the entire RDAR interval. So again, we're overscanning for the whole RDAR interval, but only that much. And so how is that determined? Well, the, the, the scanner, again, looks at the um, uh, EKG and analyzes the R wave frequency and predicts what the patient's heart rate is going to be. And based on that heart rate, it sets the pitch before you start scanning. Um, the only situation, or you, 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 you can have a situation where this causes problems if you have a patient whose heart rate is lower um, after you start scanning than when you start when um, th then. Um, um, when you're doing the initial evaluation phase. So for instance, if this, the patient is, is, is laying there before the scan and the scanner is evaluating the R to R intervals and the patient says heart rate's around 70, um, then it's going to set the pitch based on that heart rate. And the pitch is going to be slightly higher than, say, a pitch of 50 because the patient's heart rate's, heart's beating faster, so therefore the R to R interval is shorter Therefore, the time of overscanning is shorter. Therefore, the pitch is going to be a little bit higher. Um, however, if then the patient starts holding their breath and their heart rate drops down to say 40, what you can what you, trouble you can run into is that the um, pitch is actually too high relative to the patient's heart rate, and you can actually get uh, data loss or data gaps where um, you basically your your pitch is not synced up to the R to R interval and your pitch is too high, so you're not over-scanning all of the pieces of data during the r to r interval. And so you get these, these data gap errors, and really the only way to fix that is to, to do another scan, unfortunately. Um, you can prevent this ahead of time if you know the patient has, is going to have a low heart rate. Um, you can actually adjust some settings in the um, uh, CT scanner itself um, that allows you to say, okay, you know, make this pitch um, you know, a minimum, uh, a minimum of X um, so that it doesn't um, accidentally um, have too high of a pitch and, and you don't run into this data gap problem. Okay, so one last slide about pitch. So what are the exceptions to pitch? So we now have a couple new types of scanners that are out on the market that, that have kind of interesting exceptions to pitch. So one is the scanners with large area detectors. There are some vendors now with scanners that are up to 320 slice um, and, and, and growing. Um, and so these scanners have such a wide detector that they can actually cover the entire heart in one rotation, and they don't have to move the table at all. Um, so these patients, the pitch is zero um, because the, the table isn't moving at all. And, and, and those um, scanners can be very advantageous. Um, it, it, it's a very, very quick scan, and, and, and the dose can be quite low. Um, there's also this concept of high pitch acquisition. So a different kind of scanner, a dual source scanner, um, you can actually utilize projection information from two different tubes. So we had talked about the tubes before. So with dual source, imagine if you take those two tube sources and, and basically add up that projection data to effectively increase the pitch. Um, so it turns out that you can do this and you can do it with prospective acquisition that's gated to the heart. And you end up with a pitch somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.5, 3.4 or so. And, it turn, and what you're basically doing is you're zipping the patient through really, really fast. Um, and in those cases, um, you can actually get quite low dose as well because um, you, you, you have the patient um, exposed to x-ray uh, source over just a very, very short interval of time. Okay, so enough about the technical aspects and the pitch. Let's talk a little bit about dose.
So there was a big study out, actually published in JAMA, um, several years ago uh, called Protection One Study. And this study surveyed multiple different centers across the world and looked at radiation dose for cardiac CT examinations. They found that the mean estimated dose for cardiac CT, and please note this was 2009, so it was a while back, was 12 millisieverts. But it really, the, 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 that's a little bit on the high side for, for today's day and age, but the, the real interesting piece of data from this that came out from the study is that the, the mean uh, estimated dose per site varied a lot. Um, and so some sites as low as 5 millisieverts and others up to as much as 30. Um, and so there was some variability uh, between scanners, et cetera, but the, the biggest um, uh, factor seemed to be the, the, the differences in utilization of dose reduction techniques and that some places used these techniques and others didn't and, and the places that didn't ended up having very high radiation dose. Um, so we're going to talk about some of these techniques. These are tube current modulation, uh, low KV or 100 KV imaging and prospective gating which, which actually we already touched on. Um, they also saw that there were some patient factors that, that increased the dose and, and those two factors were the presence of an arrhythmia and larger patient size. So if you have an arrhythmia, um, when you do the arrhythmia detection software, oftentimes actually the scanners will automatically increase the amount of uh, imaging, the amount of the cardiac cycle they image. So some arrhythmia detected software basically automatically will kind of bump up radiation dose. Um, and then patients who are larger, uh, bigger patients, you need to have more photons to, to limit the noise. So, so clearly that's not a surprise there that dose relates to larger patient size. Okay, so, so let's talk about these techniques. So first one, 100 kV imaging. So 100 kV imaging uh, with this um, low uh, kV, you know, our standard is 120. Uh, this actually gives probably the most bang for the buck of any of our radiation dose te reduction techniques. We get about a 40, depending on what you read, 40, 45% dose reduction. And <clears throat> as an added bonus, you improve the enhancement of the vessels. So actually the Hounsfield units that you see in uh, the aorta in the coronaries is higher at the low KV. So, um, you know, you can never get something for nothing. So what's the disadvantage? The disadvantage is that you typically get noisier images in larger patients because you have reduced penetration. So the lower energy photons can't travel through the um, tissues as well. Um, they're absorbed more frequently. And so in larger patients, this becomes an issue. You can get noisy images. Um, so certainly you might want to have some local parameters to decide, you know, whether or not a patient gets 100 kV. A lot of times places use a BMI cutoff or a weight cutoff um, um, to avoid these noisy images. The other potential problem, if you have stents or heavily calcified vessels, again, low kV images aren't very high energy, so they may not penetrate through these stents or the vessels uh, calcium very well, and you might have some blooming problems. What about uh, tube current modulation? So tube current modulation only applies to retrospective gating. Um, and the concept here is that what we do, what we know in retrospective gating is that we're oftentimes imaging the entire cardiac cycle, but we really don't look at the coronaries um, outside of a, ve a very small window of the cardiac cycle. So typically, you know, um, uh, end diastole or maybe 40% of the RR interval. So what we th say is that what we're going to do is we're going to turn down the radiation dose during those phases of the cardiac cycle that are not used for diagnostic coronary imaging. And so what happens is the scanner will automatically modulate the tube current up and down um, and you can kind of set the lower parameter so um, you can decrease the tube current to 5 or up to even 40 percent of the um, energy for the diagnostic portion of the scan. So um, if you would go way low down to 5 percent really those if you if you try to reconstruct images from those portions of the cardiac cycle with that very very low dose uh, they're pretty much unreadable. So um, in those cases uh, those um, scans, you really can't reconstruct functional data. However, if you go to maybe a 20%, um, you reduce the dose to only 20% of the diagnostic dose, then usually that actually gives you enough uh, quality to, to perform functional analysis. And so um, the uh, amount of modulation you apply to your tube current depends on what you want to get out of the study, whether or not you want to perform functional evaluation or not. Um, and here's an example. So this is um, that same patient uh, with Tetralogy of Fallot and shows you a video of the beating heart. <laughs> 
Um, on the left side, we see an image taken from the literature of how a uh, tube current modulation uh, in action. Um, basically, the left sand, uh, left hand side is the um, uh, MA um, from 0% to 100%. And then the bottom is time, and this is the EKG with the MA uh, percentage um, uh, uh, overlaid. And what you see here is that there's a low, approximately 20% or so, um, MA, and then it bumps up to 100% in diastole. And then it bumps down again in systole and bumps up again in diastole. And so what you have is this modulation where at the non, uh, or at the portions of the cardiac cycle, namely systole, where you're not going to be looking at the coronaries, um, the, the dose bumps down and it bumps up again in the, the portions of the cardiac cycle where you really do care about looking at the coronary arteries. And this has the effect of reducing radiation dose somewhere in the 15% range or so. Um, you can see this really nicely on the image on the right. So this is using 20% dose modulation. And what you see is that if you're looking, just paying attention to the ventricles themselves, I, I would say that you can't really see a huge difference between different cycles in terms of the definition of the wall or the contrast between the blood pool and the wall, I, I would argue that you can actually see the wall quite well in, in all the phases of the cardiac cycle. Um, but if you look, if you put your eye on the spleen, for instance, you can actually see that you have um, portions of the uh, video where the spleen is nice and uniformly gray, and then other portions where you get a very static and noisy image. And this is the tube current modulation in action. So if you notice, the portions of the video where the spleen looks very grainy and noisy correspond to the portions of the video where the heart is contracting. And these are the areas, these are the parts of the cardiac cycle where we're dipping down, where we're reducing our dose um, uh, using this dose modulation technique. Okay, what about injection protocols? So um, uh, this is a graph on the bottom which shows um, a graph of enhancement over time. And the three different lines represent three different injection speeds from high to low. And basically the concept here is that you want to inject as fast as you can to achieve the highest peak enhancement. And if you inject very slowly, then your peak is going to be late and um, lower than if you inject faster. The um, only downside to injecting really fast is that your peak is more narrow. So you have to be um, uh, much more, uh, you have to make sure your timing is just right so that you catch the peak and you don't miss the peak and actually end up imaging when your contrast enhancement is low. So our approach is, is always to basically inject as fast as we can. Um, usually our standard injection rate is around 6 cc's per second um, and we use these power injectors to do that um, to provide our high iodine flux to maximize our peak enhancement and usually like I said we inject in the order of 6 cc's per second. And to do this, um, it really is preferred to have a very large bore IV. 18-gauge um, antecubital is really our goal for, for all of our patients. Uh, if we can, if we can't get that, then we usually have to downwardly adjust the, the rate of injection uh, um, in some of these cases. Now, how do you inject? So typically, our standard coronary CT, we're going to do a biphasic injection. And this is a standard CT where we don't really care about looking at RA or RV function or anything like that. This is just a coronary artery study where we only care about looking at the coronary arteries and their anatomy. Um, the biphasic injection uses two injectors, one with contrast and one with saline. And what happens is you do a, a, a two-phase injection. The first phase, full strength contrast, high rate, four to five. Actually, usually I say we're about six or seven. Uh, cc's per second and then you immediately follow that with a saline flush which is injected at the same rate about six cc's per second um, usually we do somewhere in the order of 40 to 50 mils of saline and what this does is it flushes out all of the high attenuation contrast from uh, the subclavian vein as well as the superior vena cava and the right atrium if that isn't done then a lot of times you can get um, um, high attenuation contrast material on the right side of the heart which can give you streak artifacts. Um, if you want to perform right ventricular functional analysis, then you have to try to do something a little bit different. And what we often do is a triphasic injection. In this case, we do the same two phases, a, um, a contrast phase, a full strength contrast phase, and then a, um, or excuse me, we, we do the same first phase, the full strength contrast phase. And then for the second phase, we actually go to a mix. We mix the um, saline 
and the contrast. We do kind of a diluted mix of contrast. And what that does is that fills up this right side of the heart with this dilute mix of contrast. So it allows us to image right-sided structures. And then the third phase, we go ahead and give the saline flush. That third phase, again, clears the superior vena cava and the subclavian. So the advantage here is that you can actually get a good look at the right ventricle and the right atrium if you wanted to do uh, segmentation and analysis of those chambers. Okay, so um, enough about acquisition and techniques. Um, let's talk about uh, post-processing. So once you get coronary CT, you know, how do you visualize it? How do you ana analyze it? Um, usually we use one of three. Uh, we use three different um, uh, types of um, post-processing all in combination in, in all of our studies. Um, we typically do a combination of maximum intensity projections or MIPS, um, which are here up on the upper left. Uh, volume rendered imaging and curve planar reformatted imaging and the MIPS and the curve planar are usually the most helpful for diagnosis um, they really help bring out stenoses and help us evaluate um, whether there is a stenosis and how severe that narrowing is compared to a reference segment in coronary CT we compare the narrowing to what we consider the nearest normal segment either proximal or distal and the MIPS can really help you with that Curve planar reformatted images where you stretch the vessel out. Um, this is a center line. Uh, the software creates a center line through the vessel and basically stretches out that center line on one image. And in those cases, you get a really nice assessment of a stenosis and can get the whole vessel in one image. Uh, also helpful for referring clinicians. Volume rendered imaging, we don't generally find it too helpful for diagnosis. However, it often helps demonstrate the findings to um, our referring clinicians and particularly in the setting of things like congenital heart disease or, or people who are post-op, um, they really help show uh, the anatomy and the relationships of the structures very, very well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, indications for coronary CT. Um, so the biggest, uh, or one of the sort of growing areas of the use of coronary CT is for the evaluation of acute chest pain in the ED. Uh, the reason being, coronary CT angiography has a very, very high negative predictive value, over 90%, and it's great for ruling out disease in patients who are either low risk or intermediate risk, who you think they probably don't have coronary artery disease, but they have chest pain, and you don't feel 100% comfortable if you're the ED doc in sending them home. Um, so there have been several multi-center studies now that have shown that ED is very safe and effective in this um, approach. Um, and you can discharge patients earlier from the emergency department so you can clear up that room in your emergency department and you may even save money, although that's a little bit, um, th there's some discrepancies there in the data. It's either similar or maybe a little bit of uh, money savings depending on how you analyze the data. But certainly it's well known that using the, the um, coronary CT and the ED saves a lot of time both for the patients and the providers and allows you to move patients through much, much more quickly uh, through the ED and limits um, those admissions that are, are not uncommon, those rule out my, uh, MI admissions where patients get admitted for serial cardiac enzyme evaluation um, or a stress test in the morning. So this is um, our appropriateness criteria for uh, coronary CT. Um, current guidelines came out about 2010, um, waiting for an update, but at this point um, the uh, is very small type here to read, but basically um, the, the, the key thing to know about cardiac CT is patients need to be symptomatic and patients need to be either low or intermediate risk. And so generally either in the acute setting in the ED or in the outpatient setting if somebody has uh, anginal symptoms or, or, or what seems like they could be anginal symptoms, um, the, the population you really want to target are those with low to intermediate risk. If they're high risk, then those patients should really be going to either cath right away or some sort of functional um, imaging like um, stress um, uh, um, nuclear studies. But those low risk patients, because of CT's high negative predictive value, that's really where the, value, where the um, uh, CT is most appropriately used. What are some other indications for CT? Congenital heart disease is a great one if you if you want to look at anatom, uh, anatomy. Um, certainly function, you have to consider the radiation dose aspects, but if you want to look just at anatomy, um, congenital heart disease is really a good reason to do cardiac CT. 
Um, if there are issues with the valves or cardiac masses and the patient has an inadequate echocardiogram, CT can be helpful in that setting. Um, we talked a little bit in um, a previous lecture about pre-ablation planning. Um, cardiac uh, CT can be very useful for that. And then finally, in patient, patients who have previous bypass grafts, um, cardiac CT can be very helpful for lo looking at, one, one, the location of the bypass grafts, and then also the patency of the bypass grafts, if that's um, something that needs to be evaluated. So I just want to show a couple uh, example ED cases. So these are um, cases from, from our uh, experience in the emergency department. Um, at Hopkins, um, for instance, this was a patient, a 53-year-old, um, no known coronary artery disease, but came in with an intermittent exertional pe chest pain. So pretty good story, but um, he actually had a pretty low risk. Um, but he had this chest pain, a little bit of an of a, um, unusual history in that it awoke him from sleep. Um, but sure enough, when we did the um, examination, we saw this is a curved planar image. He had a lot of disease in his uh, LED, right? Lots of calcification. And then this non-calcified lesion right here, which when you look short axis, you can see that the lumen itself is entirely obscured by plaque. So this is a high-grade stenosis, and this patient went on to get um, um, cardiac catheterization. Oops, sorry, got a little error there. And on cardiac cath, you can actually see really nicely this very high-grade stenosis. This actually points out a, a, a common theme in cardiac CT, which is that oftentimes cardiac CT usually overestimates the degree of stenosis a little bit compared to cardiac catheterization. So, for instance, here you see a lumen, um, whereas on our imaging we didn't see a lumen at all. It looked like, almost like there could be an occlusion. Um, but, um, uh, you know, generally cardiac CT can overestimate a bit because of its lower spatial resolution. So just something to keep in mind as you're reading these studies. Here's another case. Um, it's, I'm sorry, this is actually the same patient. Just an example of a more mild lesion. So this is the curved planar of the right coronary artery. You see this non-calcified plaque you know, probably stenosis in the order of 40% uh, or so. Um, and we go to the catheterization image, and um, you see, uh, you know, just a little bit of, uh, I think they've got an arrow there, yeah, just a little bit of narrowing, very mild narrowing there, but nothing uh, of any significance and certainly nothing that needed to be treated. So again, you know, the, the, the severity here on coronary CT, you could argue, is perhaps a little bit more impressive than on the cardiac catheterization. So something to keep in mind as you read out these studies. Um, it's a different example. This is a, a, a school bus driver who had intermittent atypical chest pain. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we did the calcium score, and it was negative, but the patient, sure enough, had this uh, tight stenosis here in the LED from non-calcified plaque. Um, with that history, um, they took her right to cardiac cath, and sure enough, we had a very nice lesion that matched what we saw in cardiac CT here, um, and that was treated by stenting the patient. The patient did great. Um, this is another example. This is a patient we saw in the ED who had um, a recent cocaine use and has this very high-grade narrowing of the circumflex coronary artery here and here, and you can actually pick up a perfusion defect in the lateral wall, uh, which is the territory supplied by that diseased coronary artery. This was presumed to be um, um, uh, to represent um, um, vasospasm um, due to that high-grade narrowing the patient was treated with calcium channel blockers and got better. Okay, so for this last segment I just want to talk a little bit about pitfalls and challenges in coronary CT, um, some issues you may encounter in practice. One thing we run into is stents. So um, we have this problem that, that we get patients referred to us for stent evaluation and unfortunately um, CT is not perfect for stents. Um, CT can evaluate for stents. However, uh, it, it can evaluate all stents. And, and there are a couple issues. One is, um, as you can see from this uh, image from the literature, not all stents are created equal. Um, so the patients may have different stents, and different stents may have um, varying amounts of artifact um, uh, based on their composition. Um, so for instance, some of these stents you see, you can actually see the lumen quite well, whereas others, um, you know, the lumen's a little bit obscured and be very difficult to evaluate for any stenosis within the lumen. Say, for instance, in this stent right here, it might be a pretty tough call. Um, so that's one problem we face. And then the other problem, the major problem we face is the size of the stent. So it turns out that, you know, recent studies have shown that we really can't, with cardiac CT, reliably evaluate a stent that's 
less than three millimeter in size. So um, it's an important thing to, to let your providers know um, if they're asking you, you know, can we do this case? Can we look at the stent? Three millimeters is really the cutoff, and they'll know how big the stents are. So um, we really can't reliably give evaluation of um, stent lumen if it's a less than three millimeter stent. Here's just an example of a stent and how challenging it can be. This patient has um, uh, 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 several stents that are, you know, have been laid down one after the other after the other. Um, this shows one technique you can use to try and improve stent visualization is that's, that's adjusting the windowing. Um, when you have a really nice, uh, a really narrow window, you get a lot of blooming artifact. If you go wide with your window, you can actually start to see the inside of the stent lumen, but it's still quite difficult, particularly in these areas where it gets a little tighter. Um, so these are the challenges we face with stents. Other things you can do, um, it turns out newer iterative reconstruction methods actually provide a better visualization of the lumen through the stent than the older filtered back projection methods. So certainly if you have a stent, you absolutely want to do an iterative reconstruction and you would typically want to do a slightly sharper reconstruction kernel as well. That helps limit the blooming artifact and allow you to visualize um, the stent lumen uh, better. Well, what is a positive stent? Uh, you know, what does it look like if you have an instant restenosis? So what, what we're looking for is that there's a dark blob uh, in the middle of the stent lumen, basically, and that signifies a uh, plaque uh, sitting inside the stent lumen. So in this case, you can see here a couple little dark blobs here. These are areas of instant restenosis, approximately, and this long series of stents in this patient here, you can see two different levels I have pointed out, one where it's patent, and then one where it's got uh, uh, a stenosis. So you can see that the lumen here is dark and um, on static images it maybe doesn't do it uh, justice as, as you're scrolling through dynamically you can really appreciate the differences between the more patent areas and the areas with the, the, the dark um, lumen uh, due to instant restenosis. So just to sum up, stents Visualization is difficult if less than three millimeter in size. You want to try to use those sharp kernels and iterative methods to, to reduce blooming artifact. And if you see low attenuation, then that suggests restenosis. Okay, what about this case? This is a case of myocardial bridging. So nicely demonstrated here where the left anterior descending coronary artery dives into the myocardium. It's surrounded by myocardium on all sides. You can see that on the short axis image as well. What do you do with these cases? Um, here's another one. This is actually myocardial bridging on the right side, where the right coronary artery here is diving into the RV myocardium and surrounded by myocardium for a long segment. Well, fortunately, myocardial bridging is generally not a big issue, and so mo um, generally we'll mention it in the body report, but um, tend to dismiss it. Um, it. You know, it's something we'd encounter incidentally in a large, large number of patients, and so um, generally myocardial bridging is not something that's going to cause patients any problems. Um, this is another example of an uh, interesting um, thing with myocardial bridging is that when you have patients with lots of disease, like this patient here, it turns out <coughs> the bridged areas are generally spared from disease. And this may be part of the reason why the bridged areas don't cause any problems for these patients. The disease is all upstream of the bridge, and in this bridged area here, you actually see that the, the vessel looks perfectly fine. And this, is, um, uh, this has been shown in, in, in several studies that um, bridged areas do not develop atherosclerosis. And so, um, again, you know, we generally don't make too big of a deal about myocardial bridging. Um, large studies have shown no increased mortality. It's very, very, very common. Um, occasionally we'll mention it if the patient has no other disease. We may mention it um, as a possible cause for angina because there have been some studies that have shown an association with uh, ischemia on uh, uh, nuclear medicine imaging. Um, so, uh, you know, in some cases, if you're really stuck and you, you can't really find an explanation for somebody's chest pain and they do have a bridge um, that, that looks prominent, then, you, you know, you might want to uh, think about doing a stress test to see if there's any um, ischemia that could account for those symptoms. But generally, um, we let the bridges go, and it's just something we don't um, really even mention in the impression of our reports. Um, 
this is just a last uh, example of, of challenges of cardiac CT. Uh, calcium is, is always your enemy in, in the world of uh, cardiac CT reading. Um, this is because calcium uh, has um, associated with it this blooming effect. And basically blooming just means that there's an artifact which the calcium itself looks larger than it is in reality. Um, and so this is especially bad if you have a narrow window for visualization. The calcium looks really, really big. So you always want to make sure you have a wide window. And then you can see that, that there's some lumen wrapping around this calcium here. Still, you'd be hard-pressed to dismiss this. You, know, you might call it a, somewhere in the 40 to 50% range. Um, and this is the problem. We go to cardiac catheterization for the same patient. You can see there's, there's hardly any stenosis at all. So um, calcium is not really your friend in cardiac CT, and you always have to be careful about the potential for overcalling a stenosis in the setting of calcium. Sometimes you're stuck, you just, there's just nothing you can do, um, but you want to try and window wide and use sharp kernels just like your approaches with uh, stents to try and limit the blooming effects. Here's another example. This patient has multiple calcified lesions in this branch here um, off of the circumflex, this obtuse marginal branch, and it looks like there's pretty heavily diseased vessel here, all these calcified plaques, and then you know you look at the the cardiac cath, and you wouldn't even know there's anything there. There may be some irregularity, but not really any significant stenosis. So, again, calcium, not really your friend. It, it often will look a lot worse on CT than on cardiac cath uh, when you have these calcified lesions. So, something to be careful of. Um, you want to maximize your visualization using sharp kernels and iterative reconstruction, a very wide window but you may be unable to exclude severe stenosis. Um, and this is, this is okay. This is a known problem with cardiac CT. Um, you just have to make note of it so that um, you, know, there is, you know that there is some ambiguity there. Um, your referring clinician may know that when they go to cath, they may find that this lesion actually is not as severe as it looks on cardiac CT. Okay, so to sum up, um, we reviewed a lot of things. We reviewed um, how to perform cardiac CT. We reviewed some indications. We reviewed some cases and some pitfalls. Um, so just to, to go back to the beginning, um, ECG gating is necessary for cardiac CT examinations. It's important to think about when you set up your protocols what kind of gating you want to use. Prospective gating has the benefits of reduced dose, but the drawback of no functional information and less of a, of a fudge factor or less of a safety factor if there's an arrhythmia Retrospective gating can be used for functional analysis and can better compensate for arrhythmias, but um, that's at the expense of higher dose. Um, you want to you want to make sure you you know about your injection protocol and what kind of protocol you want to use, whether whether you know biphasic or triphasic injection protocols. Um, dose is highly variable, as we saw, and so it's important to really apply all the strategies you can to keep your dose low. And um, as far as the appropriateness goes, um, just as a rule of thumb, coronary CT is most appropriate in patients with low to intermediate probability of coronary disease, but concern for occult coronary disease, and I would, I would make a note that they have to be symptomatic as well. So um, you know, coronary CT is not indicated for asymptomatic patients, so you really want to have low to intermediate risk with some symptoms suggestive of possible coronary artery disease. Um, one last slide, um, you want to make sure to know the um, uh, a typical um, nomenclature of the coronary arteries and branch coronary arteries. And as we discussed, stents and calcium can be difficult to deal with at coronary CT, but you can really try and minimize the artifact as much as possible by using sharp kernels, iterative reconstruction, and, and the wide windows. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.